There's more to Goodfellas that you wouldn't otherwise know just from viewing the film, things that could happen to anyone. But more importantly, as you dig deeper, you'll discover how or why things happened the way they did. Want to know more? As discussed in part one, and for obvious reasons, Pileggi's novel, Wise Guy, goes further into the lives of characters in Goodfellas, based on Henry Hill's accounts. In the film, Henry paints a broader picture of Paul Vario, a capo in the Lucchese crime family, as well as significant characters working under Vario, himself included. The Lucchese crime family was one of New York Mafia's notorious five families, which also included the Gambino crime family, a fact known to mob movie fans with some familiarity on the subject. The Gambino family was led by the infamous John Gotti, who took over his family around the period of the events in the movie, Goodfellas. One of Gotti's men was Billy Batts, a fact that explains why retribution was sought for his death. It answers the question as to why Tommy DeVito was killed, a significant question, in light of all the conflict among the crime families, as seen in various other mafia films of that period. Why, indeed, would Vario get rid of one of his better underlings? The answer is simple. The Lucchese and Gambino families had close ties during this time. In other words, on account of these close ties, Paul Vario owed it to John Gotti to give the green light and have Tommy, who was a member of Jimmy's crew, one of Vario's good earners. And in the mob, getting rid of a good earner was not taken lightly, as explained in a previous video. United through marriage in 1962, with Carlo Gambino's eldest son, Thomas Gambino, marrying the daughter of Tommy Lucchese, Francis, in a wedding that was instrumental in rendering the Gambino control over part of Lucchese's rackets at what is now the Kennedy Airport. These two families would then pose a significant threat to the rest of the Mafia. The families were now in control of not only the airport, but also the commission and most organized crime in the Big Apple as well. The powerful union posed a threat to the Bonanno crime family's boss, Joseph Bonanno whose design it was to be boss of all bosses. This would explain why he, shortly after the wedding, would draw up a plan to have the Lucchese and Gambino heads killed, thereby taking over both families and all that came with it. To detail what happened next would lead us down a rabbit hole best avoided, for now. Suffice it to say, those dark and dangerous times are not represented in the movie, most likely to keep the focus at ground level, as Scorsese had intended. Remember how I've mentioned that the mob is its own social club? Well, it is. And at that time, Robert's Lounge was their stomping ground. Contrary to what was attributed to the movie as Henry's Bar, Robert's Lounge was in fact owned by Jimmy the Gent Burke, which explains a curious thing that Robert De Niro's character, Jimmy Conway, says in one scene. Jimmy insists to Burke that drinks are on the house in trademark De Niro style that's both intimidating and impressive hinting that the bar belonged to him and not Henry. And in real life, it got raided by the feds. In its basement were found bones that were reported to have belonged to Marty Krugman, a man responsible for the Lufthansa tip depicted in the movie as wig store owner Maury Kessler. Rumor has it that another set of remains found on Jimmy's property belonged to lifelong friend and associate Tommy Desimone, which serves as another curious but conflicting point to De Niro's character Jimmy behaving all broken up over the death of Joe Pesci's character. Still, it's just an unsubstantiated rumor, proving just how much of the real lives and events that inspired the movie will remain unsolved mysteries, no matter how deep you dig. Now, what happens when everyone you work with is also everyone you know? The result is a very small social circle. It then becomes understandable to learn that underboss Paul Vario, depicted as Polly Cicero, had an affair with Henry Hill's wife, Karen, despite the strict mafia code on violating another man's wife. Paul Sorvino's character, Polly Cicero, has a line in the movie that's easy to miss. Polly explains to Henry how it would not be a problem for him to help smooth things out between Henry and Karen. He tells Henry, I know how to talk to her, especially to her. If you were aware of Vario's affair with Karen, this line would jump out at you and explain how Karen had survived on her own all those years while Henry was in jail. Could Henry have complained about this to anyone? Complain about his boss? But to whom? Henry may have had mafia law on his side, but the fact that Vario never got into trouble for this affair shows just how powerful Vario was at the time. Unfortunately, 
The affair was not the only violation of mafia law. Although not included in the movie either, the other violation was attempted rape of Karen, Henry Hill's wife as portrayed in Goodfellas by the devastatingly gorgeous yet feisty Lorraine Bracco, and the attempted rape was by none other than her husband's best friend, Tommy. Yes, the character inspired by real-life bad boy Thomas Desimone was bad in so many more ways not depicted in the movie. Hill shares personal accounts in his biography, Gangsters and Goodfellas, about how he found out that Tommy violently beat Karen and tried to force himself on her shortly before he was released from prison. Tommy, as alluded throughout the movie, was an uncontrollable menace. Had Henry known much sooner of the attempted rape and the brutal beating of his wife, he would have dealt with Tommy himself, he says. Although Henry never got the chance to make Tommy pay for it, Tommy clearly had it coming because Polly found out and took care of it, something that is not so obvious in the movie. For all intents and purposes, at the time, Karen belonged to Paul Vario, so just imagine how this was more than enough reason for Paul to take Tommy's actions very personally, and it explains quite nicely what ultimately led to the hit on Tommy Desimone. Another reason was, of course, the murder of Billy Bats. Billy, known as William Billy Bats Benvena in real life, a.k.a. William Devino, was part of the Gambino family and friend of John Gotti. The ugly side of being a mobster is mostly seen in events revolving around this man's death. From the confrontation between the mobsters to Tommy's violent reaction, dealing with moving a rotting corpse, and finally to Tommy getting whacked. To keep attention sharply focused on the gravity of Tommy's actions, the movie doesn't drag out the timeline of these events. In Pelleggi's Wise Guys, Tommy actually obsesses over Billy's insult for a few weeks. Also, it can be speculated that Bats wasn't killed over his insult, but rather due to his loan shark business, which had been taken over by Jimmy. In the movie, we see Billy telling Jimmy that he has mouths to feed, alluding to a possible discussion about business. It is looking more and more as though, unless these individuals have recorded confessions, it is impossible to know how these things really went down as most of the characters are long dead and buried, in this case, possibly incinerated. As we learn more about who Jimmy was and revisit his character in the movie, it becomes equally believable that Jimmy was behind the idea to whack Billy Bats. Just look at how he had dealt with everyone who had staked their claim in the Lufthansa heist. Money meant more to Jimmy than anything else. Well, almost anything else. Save for one, his son. Jimmy loved mob life not only because it was extremely profitable for a guy like him, but also perhaps because he had people under him to boss around. Ask yourself, isn't it more fun with friends? Throughout the movie, he works with fellow associates, Henry and Tommy. You could say they aren't just associates, but a lot like younger brothers to him. So it isn't hard to believe that he was capable of raising his own kids. In real life, Jimmy Burke had at least three children, but to this point, it was only his son, Francis, who played an active role in his criminal life. Upon his birth, Jimmy's firstborn was named Francis James Burke Conway, taking the name Burke from the adoptive family who raised Jimmy and the name Conway from his grandmother. Frankie is what Jimmy's first boy was called, and little Frankie grew up around criminals, with Hill as Uncle Henry, Desimone as Uncle Tommy, and Karen and Tommy's wife, Teresa, as his aunts. As a young man, Frankie aided his father's crew in the Lufthansa heist by driving one of their backup vehicles, but his life in crime didn't start with the infamous robbery. In Wise Guy, Hill shares details about Tommy taking Jimmy's son on his first hit, and how the kid fared very well, filling Jimmy with so much pride. You'd have thought the kid had won a medal, says Hill. However, like his one-time mentor, Uncle Tommy, things didn't end well for Frankie either. At the age of 26 or 27, he was shot multiple times for a cocaine deal gone wrong. It is said that Frankie was under constant abuse from his father and that this was unsuccessfully used by authorities in an attempt to make him snitch on his father. His lack of relevance in Jimmy's life may very well be the reason why he was not portrayed in the movie at all, although it may also be likely due to interference from his sister, Catherine, who married Banano crime family member Cap Regime Anthony and Delicato and who is still very much alive to this day.